Well, when the film first came out, the first week it ever played in Phoenix, Arizona, that's when I saw it for the first time. I was in high school. And I couldn't really comprehend the enormity of the experience, so I wasn't really able to digest it in one sitting. I actually walked out of the theater stunned and speechless and didn't quite understand the impact that film had had on me until months later. I'm talking about months later, because I didn't see it two times in the one week. I saw it one time, and it just pulverized me. I went out and bought this Maurice Jarre soundtrack, and for the next couple of months, I played the score over and over and over again. They had a, sort of a little production book inside the soundtrack album. I just devoured each picture, wanting to understand how that film was made. It was a miracle, that picture. What is it, Major Lawrence, that attracts you personally to the desert? It's clean. Phoenix, Arizona is a desert community, and I was raised in the desert, and so I had an affinity for Lawrence's love of the desert and understood his obsession with how clean the desert was. And that's what I always thought, that the desert was cleaner than the city and the neighborhoods, that nature just swept all the debris out of the desert and kept it pristine every moment. And it was that moment of Lawrence and nature sort of at one with each other that I really could relate to on that very natural level. Oh, thanks, Dryden. This is going to be fun. Lawrence, only two kinds of creature get fun in the desert, Bedouins and gods, and you're neither. Take it from me. For ordinary men, it's a burning, fiery furnace. No, Dryden, it's going to be fun. On a purely tactile and visual level, it was just the transitions. The transition that blew me away was when he blew out the match and it became the sunrise over the desert. I mean, moments like that, which I couldn't articulate then, still subconsciously aroused my curiosity about, well, how do they get those moments? How do those shots happen? Do they have to actually get up in the morning at 4 o'clock and wait for the sun to rise? I guess they actually did. David Lean was that kind of a, of a poet, novelist, filmmaker, naturalist. Uh, Mr. Bentley, you must know as much about Colonel Lawrence as anybody does. Yes, it was my privilege to know him and to make him known to the world. He was a poet, a scholar, and a mighty warrior. Thank you. He was also the most shameless exhibitionist since Barnum and Bailey. The T.E. Lawrence story, which was important in other countries, was rather obscure here. So I don't think there were a lot of critics that were so politically correct to attack David Lean and the picture for historical and personal inaccuracies. But it was a whole different time in the 60s. Today, it probably would be attacked by individual journalists and writers who also would like to set the record straight, tell people the way it really was, and make a name for themselves. And I think probably the film wouldn't have ducked the bullet today the way it did then. I think it all depends on what history you're playing with. Are you playing with obscure history, history that most certainly Americans know nothing about? Or are you dealing with the kind of history that's taught every day in schools? In a sense, there's a kind of revisionist history for entertainment purposes that I don't agree with if it violates such an important era of culture. I would rail against anything about the Holocaust that wasn't absolutely authentically honest. But there are certain movies like that that I think allow you to take artistic interpretive license when you have a character who is such a character, I mean, he's so bigger than life, and I just don't quite think that film would have been as romantically poetic had it been just a chronology of the actual life of T.E. Lawrence. To be great again, it seems that we need the English, or... Oh. What no man can provide, Mr. Lawrence, we need a miracle. When I first met David Lean, it was sort of, for me, it was meeting my guru. I mean, somebody who I had worshipped and studied and dreamt of meeting someday. And he didn't disappoint me at all when I first met him. He was intimidating in his intellect. And the fact that I couldn't keep up with his knowledge about history and about current events and about film. And yet I also understood that there were directors and filmmakers who he admired and loved. In return, I realized that there is a kind of pecking order that David Lean was inspired and he inspired a whole generation of filmmakers and some of us inspire other young film students who want to become professional directors and writers and actors and actresses and that's all really important and I really understood that from him and we sort of talked that same language. But then we got down to talking about things like, well, how'd you get the footprints out of the sand for take two? 
Because I saw those camels were walking for three quarters of a mile, and then what about take two? And then he would explain to me why the film took something like 285 actual shooting days to finish. And you understood why sometimes it was only getting one shot a day. I was involved in the restoration of Lawrence, and I remember the honor of sitting next to David the first time we showed him his own film. And he watched it for the first time in a long time with us, all finished, brand new answer print, on the available printing stock that was much better than the available printing stock he had in the 60s. But instead of being quiet and watching the picture for his own pleasure, he wanted to talk me through every single scene. So I got a kind of, the what we have on our DVDs today, where you've got the director talking about his film while you watch the picture, you got the narration on one track. It was exactly the experience I had, except it was live. And David Lean is next to me, giving me all the details of how every single sequence was shot, where it was shot, what Peter O'Toole was like that morning, that was a good morning for Peter, a bad morning for Peter, what it was like working with Omar Sharif, what it was like working with Alec Guinness again. I mean, David was narrating the backstage How I Made Lawrence of Arabia while we were watching together Lawrence of Arabia Restored. It was an amazing couple of hours for me. I'm going to just be boring like everybody else and not be original and just say that I think the Mirage sequence is still the greatest miracle I've seen on film. There's a number of films I dip into for inspiration, and of course, there's three David Lean films that I look at a lot. One is Lawrence of Arabia. That's probably my favorite David Lean picture. My second favorite is Bridge in the River Kwai. And then I know it was sort of panned by the critics, but when I saw Dr. Zhivago, I thought it was a masterpiece. And I was just also very emotionally pulverized by that picture. So those three films I every once in a while look at again, especially before I start my own picture. May God, your agent, Akaba! Here's what happened today. They could make Lawrence of Arabia today digitally by combining digital effects with live action effects. But in a sense, that's like going to Victoria Falls. And instead of taking the National Geographic Hasselblads to photograph the falls, you say, you know, we don't have to send a photographer to Victoria Falls. Let's digitize Victoria Falls. They'll never tell the difference. Well, people can tell the difference. They know a real wave from a digital wave, a real twister from a digital twister. People know this. And I think that Lawrence today would probably cost about $285 million to make in today's money. And to do it digitally would be a tremendous sin because what makes that film, unlike any film that can be made again, is that it was done naturally with the elements of light and sound and the, maybe the greatest screenplay ever written for the motion picture medium.